you love the church, Lord. Uh, how, Lord, you're God of order, not disorder, so you want a church of order, Lord, and we pray that we would understand all about it that you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So we think about the organization of the church. Uh, uh, of course, they had uh, church officers, and they had stated times of meetings, uh, as well, in the first day of the week, and, uh, following Christ's resurrection. And uh, in fact, when we read in Acts, it ta- even talks about a meeting uh, coming together every day. So uh, uh, it's important uh, to come together with God's people and uh, to set certain times of worship. Um, they raised money, of course, for the Lord's work and sent letters of commendation to other churches. Uh, the government of the church, and when, you, uh, when you think about uh, uh, the church uh, and the systems of government that exist, there are different ones, of course. Uh, the Catholics uh, have the, the Pope. He functions as the supreme religious authority. Uh, when he speaks from the chair of St. Peter in matters of faith and morals, his words, uh, they believe, like the scriptures themselves, are infallible. And the Pope thus governs the faithful through the, the college of cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and priests assigned to uh, pastor local churches. Uh, the basis of this form is said to be given by Christ himself in Matthew 16, uh, verse uh, 18 through 19. Uh, but uh, there's uh, the, using those scriptures for that basis is uh, there's really not uh, a good understanding John Davis observes the Roman Catholic Church points to these verses as the foundation of the papacy. Note, however, that nothing whatsoever is mentioned here concerning a succession of bishops following Peter. And in John, the power of the keys is given not just to Peter, but to all the uh, disciples. So, uh, and there's the Episcopal form. Uh, this approach is espoused by Orthodox, the Orthodox Church, the Episcopal, Lutheran, and Methodist churches. There's a government by bishops, aided by priests and deacons. The essential concept is that the right to consecrate other bishops and ordain both priests and deacons belongs only to the bishops themselves. This provides a succession of bishops and their rulership over the two subordinate ministries. And uh, different scriptural, they'll try to uh, um, scriptural support on that. Uh, the Episcopal form is based partly on the authority of the apostles, which really does not have a counterpart in the New Testament church beyond the apostolic era. And uh, we say Christ uh, gave a unique authority to the to the apostles, but. Uh, then there's the federal representative, the Presbyterian system, taken from the Greek word P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. Uh, uh, the word found 62 times in its noun form is always translated by the English word elder. The system of government is best illustrated by the Presbyterian and Reformed churches of today. Federal system operates somewhat similar to that of, a, of the U.S. government. Each local church duly elects ruling el- elders to represent them. This group forms the church session. A distinction is usually made in this session between those ruling elders who govern but do not teach, preach, or administer the ordinances, and those elders, the chief being the pastor, who do. And. Uh, <clears throat> So basically, uh, uh, you have 
church leaders, which are called the elders, and uh, you have the pastor, which is an elder, but oversees the elders. And the elders are really, uh, in the biblical sense, are to serve more as an advisory type uh, uh, place to the pastor. Then there's the congregational democratic form. This type of government is uh, clearly seen in the Baptist churches, congregational, evangelical, free, disciples of Christ, and independent Bible churches. Followers of this form believe no outside man or group of men should exercise authority over a local assembly. Therefore, the government should be in the hands of the members themselves. The pastor is considered to be the single elder in the church. He is called and elected by the church congregation. Deacons are then chosen to assist him in shepherding uh, the flock. So you have the uh, different forms there of government. And uh, uh, some go by denominational lines, others don't within, uh, even now in the Baptist community, uh, not all of them are congregational democratic form. Uh, some of them are elder, elder type form. So as you get into the word and, and deciphering it. In the South, uh, you, you find, uh, you find uh, some local churches and congregations that are, mm, some are uh, family oriented and they, they should, we all should be family oriented in, as far as the Christ family, the church family. But you have some that are Maybe heavy, uh, you know, certain family bloodlines. Okay, so uh, and then uh, also uh, you can run into a lot of times what I refer to as uh, church bosses uh, in in churches. So these are people that uh, others would say these are influential people in the church. So they have influence. And sort of like E.F. Hutton, you remember that commercial? When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. So you might be at a, at a public meeting or something, and then when E.F. stands up, you know who has the influence because people listen. So that person would take so many votes. And that's the problem you run into in the democratic uh, uh, system, also in the democratic uh, type system. Uh, as far as the church and church and government, okay, the government of the church should be different than the government of a nation. But uh, also what you run into in the government of, uh, of church is if you do it uh, congregational or uh, democratic form in that sense is um, the same. Persons say their laws are members. They they vote and uh, sort of uh, move the church direction where they're going. Uh, but the problem with that is is uh, not all of them's at the same spiritual level. So you got mature believers, immature believers. You got weak believers. You got some that's not really believers. Uh, trying to direct. And uh, a lot of times they don't even know the, the scriptures on what God lays out about the church and things, uh, making uh, decisions. So uh, you just have to look, you have to study in the Word of God and uh, see uh, different forms uh, that are presented today and see what the Bible truly uh, represents and uh, what, what the Bible would uh, give to us. Uh, we know this, God, the Lord Jesus, is the head of the church, okay? And we're all to be subordinate to him. And uh, the pastor, Jesus is the shepherd, the pastor is under shepherd. And uh, the church is to work in unity and, uh, and moving uh, forward. And uh, the shepherd certainly has given us uh, in the scriptures uh, how to do that and what to do. Of course, you're going to come across certain decisions. Now, in the Southern Baptist churches, they have committees, a lot of committees. 
okay? Sometime. Committee for this, committee for that. Okay, and then that committee will bring it uh, but maybe before the deacons. And then the deacons will bring it, if they pass it, bring it before the church. Okay, so it's like a pro process uh, uh, there of getting things done. Uh, I think when you look biblically uh, into the Word, it, it's done a little different. And um, those, those type of things. Uh, one pastor... Um, he, he put it this way there's different forms different ones work uh, but the church sort of has to decide which one they're going to use <laughs> and that, that's pretty uh, uh, wise uh, for different people in different uh, places uh, they have different forms I think they're, we do get a biblical uh, a biblical form a biblical uh, church governing there, but uh, the church uh, operates a certain way. Now what happens uh, also is uh, church has all this mapped out, the way they operate and all. Somebody comes into that church from a different system or a different mind thought and they'll maybe come in to try to change it. Well, the going in they should know the system of them, the way the system works, and they that's the church they feel like God's calling them to, if that's the case, and they they come in and they should be uh, submissive to that. They shouldn't go in trying to uh, uh, change it, unless it was God's man, God's leader he was bringing to a place to try to make it more biblical. You, you understand what I'm saying there? Um, so, uh, say somebody uh, <clears throat> grew up in a certain denomination, and then they went to another denominational type church that had a different form of government. Okay, and that's the way they were used to and uh, thought. And so they went in and said, well, this way it needs to be here. Well, that just creates chaos, division, those type of things. Okay. But. Uh, clear thing is Jesus isn't head and we need to all be subordinate to him. Uh, a lot of decisions uh, the leadership uh, don't need to so much make so some of that can be designated to uh, ministry leaders. Uh, I mean the car colors of carpets, uh, a lot of little things. I mean you, you can you don't want it to be like the uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., where nothing gets ever gets accomplished. You know what I'm saying? Something's got to get done and accomplished. So you give, you put people in charge of certain things, you give them responsibility, you trust them, and uh, they form a ministry team and they they get it done. It's in their calling and in their strengths of where uh, God leads. But anybody that ever leads in any capacity, you're always going to have people to to maybe disagree in the way that you go about doing what you do. And uh, you just have to know that and realize that. that it's, that's just people. And uh, it's usually somebody who's not going to do anything anyway. They just want to talk about who is doing it. You know, it could be a ministry. A ministry could be open for a long time. Somebody steps up and say they want to do that. Then all of a sudden, it's, it hadn't been done for months, but all of a sudden everybody or a bunch of people has got opinions on it or how they would do it, you know. Well, that's demonic. And <laughs> so you just have to uh, press ahead and stay close to the Lord and let the uh, Lord guide you and the scriptures uh, guide you and also come under, uh, of course, the, the authority uh, of the church and what God has in place there. So let's think about the officers of the church. Of course, uh, uh, who are they? Uh, bishops, the word bishop, let's think about that. Uh, the Bible talks about in 1 Timothy 3, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And then Titus 1.5, for this cause left thee, I thee, pray 
that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordained elders in every city as I had appointed uh, thee. And uh, so the Greek word for bishop and uh, E-P-I-S, K-O-P-O-S, it refers to an overseer. Okay, so the overseer, and people looked at that as uh, the office of the pastor. Another name found in the New Testament uh, uh, refers to elder. So you have some disagreement about elder. Some say it's the same, pastor, elder, bishop, all as the same office, and this is where you come into some disagreement. Other uh, congregations would see them designating uh, different roles, okay, um, as in that. So uh, then, of course, in uh, 1 Timothy, it gives, uh, it talks about uh, the bishop and uh, uh, how they qualify. Uh, again, they should be able to, they should, they're not going to be perfect, okay, only Jesus is perfect, okay. And, but they should be able to be advancing, growing, maturing in those things and be able uh, to do those things. Also, you have the office of deacon and uh, the qualifications there of deacon. Now, what's funny is uh, a lot of churches, some churches do not believe in uh, elders or elder uh, body having elders along with a pastor and elders. But then their deacon, they'll have deacons, and they'll allow their deacons to serve as elder pastors and make decisions in that uh, situation. So they have a little. Uh, that's where it starts getting uh, confused and, uh, to each one's role. And the Bible clearly uh, shares uh, the roles there uh, of each and how they're. They vary and they differ. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of that. <clears throat> you know, it is good to know. And, uh, there is some good scripture to look at and you see there, uh, especially in Timothy, and you see uh, uh, some qualifying uh, characteristics of both. Uh, let's think of the duties of church officers. What do they do? Pastors. The pastor is to administer the the ordinances of the church. He's to, of course, be a man of prayer. Uh, he's to warn the flock. He is to study the word. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So it's very important. A lot of time needs to be put into the study of God's word. God's word, and even if you preach the passage before, it needs to be studied. God's speaking uh, to the pastor through that word. He needs to bring uh, the congregation good food, okay? Uh, quality food. And it comes from the word of God. So he's to study the word. He's to preach that word. Uh, that's, that's to be studied. Okay, and he's to exhort and to rebuke the people. He, he is to watch over their souls. He's to feed and lead his flock. He is to be an example to, to the flock. Uh, it is, it's said uh, concerning uh, Paul's fourfold perspective of pastoral, pastoral priorities in Acts 20, 19 through 22. From uh, John MacArthur Jr. and leadership, God's priority for the church, uh, a right perspective toward God, a right perspective toward the church, a right perspective toward the laws, and a right perspective toward Himself. And that, that's a good little um, uh, thing there for us to think about and to uh, have so that pastors to have that right perspective. And then the deacons, uh, there's uh, the role and the work of the, the deacons and the, the word uh, as we think about uh, uh, deacons. The word deacon comes from a compound Greek word that means to stir up the dust. 
presents a picture of one who's moving so rapidly through the dusty lanes of the villages of Palestine to discharge his duty that his feet kick up dust as he goes. There was so much for the deacons to do, they could not loiter nor tarry. They went about their ministry with such diligence that they were stirring up the dust. Thus, those who were set apart to this ministry were called those who stir up the dust, or deacons. In other words, uh, they should be some of the best servants you have. They should be so moving around serving, you know. And uh, that's where I say uh, some congregations uh, have misplaced the role of the deacons into more of a managerial uh, in charge type thing. That's not the way it was meant to be at all. They were to be uh, the greatest and the strongest of the servants uh, there. Well, the ordinance of the church, of course, is the Lord's Supper, and uh, uh, we'll be doing the Lord's Supper, and uh, the names of the Lord's Supper in the Bible, uh, the, the Eucharist, it's called the Eucharist, it's uh, the Greek word for giving of thanks. It's taken from 1 Corinthians 11.24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, the blessing or the eulogia, uh, this name is taken from 1 Corinthians 10.16, the cup of blessing. Uh, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. Then there's the Greek word for offering. Uh, this name came into being because gifts or offerings for the poor were made at the celebration of the supper. And then, of course, communion. This name derives from 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, the communion of the blood of Christ. And then the breaking of bread. This expression is found in Acts 2 and is thought by some to refer to the Lord's Supper, and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So just different names that refers to uh, the Lord's Supper or communion uh, that a church would share in, signifying, uh, you know, the, the, the shed blood of Christ and the body that it was broken on the cross and uh, beaten that uh, he might become our substitute and take our sins. Okay? So uh, you have different views uh, concerning the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine teaches that the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ when consecrated by the priest during Mass, even though they still look and taste the same. Thus the one partaking literally eats Christ's flesh and drinks his blood. Uh, needless to say, this is without scriptural uh, support. Okay, 